And, and so what the uh, business model of pornography is, is not so much the selling of sex, which is why I said that porn is not about sex. Mm. Porn is actually about the types of sex or the variety of sex that you could possibly engage in. Mm. Um, and, and so much so that the satisfaction, and this is not something that I mentioned in the article, but um, I mentioned it in another mm. context, that the satisfaction of sexual desire is actually not what the porn industry is about. Mm. Uh, in fact, the satisfaction of sexual desire uh, ruins the business model um, of pornography. Hello and welcome to The Naked Gospel, where we re-envision what it looks like to follow Jesus and to actually know his gospel, to know his gospel with our bodies, uh, with our relationships, and particularly with our sexuality, because nothing will sober you up faster than a naked man dying on a cross for you. And that's the counter image to pornography uh, and the hookup culture around us, a naked man dying on a cross. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Dr. Matthew John Paul Tan. It's a name that I enjoy saying. He is a, a friend of the podcast and I'm excited to have him back on. Last time we worked through an article that he had written uh, at an academic level uh, titled Pornography and Christology, helping us to see why we go to pornography and how we look to it for salvation, how we look to it to save us from uh, kind of these mundane moments in our life. And today we're going to be readdressing that. We're going to be looking at uh, what it looks like to actually be human um, because we aren't just attracted to pornography or the apps of hookup culture because we're aroused. We go to them when we're bored and we go to them for novelty. We go to them for variety. We go to them to celebrate for our anxiety, for our depression, when we're sad, when we're lonely. Um, there are are, it's kind of just a catch all for human experience and sex is a very powerful thing. And so when it's misappropriated, uh, we want to know what's taking place, but also what it looks like to actually follow Jesus and to regain some of our humanity, especially for those of us who have a, a beat up past of abusing this stuff and falling captive to it. So what does it look like to actually follow Jesus? Just to be present in life, to be present with the people around us, to be present with God, uh, which isn't something I don't think that's something I was ever taught just to be present with him, to be still and know that he is God. And so we're going to just be processing uh, just around that kind of geography today, uh, because it's what our souls really need when it comes to just becoming human and following Jesus well. So thank you for hanging with us. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please Share it with somebody you think would uh, profit from it. And if you haven't, please subscribe, track with us. If you hit the bell, it compels it compels YouTube uh, to let you know when these videos uh, come up. Uh, you get to actually pick uh, what you watch. It's a novel thought, isn't it? Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us, man. Hi, Shane. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm so glad I, was, I didn't um, scare off your listeners. Hello again, listeners. <laughs> no, not at all. Actually, the last the last podcast has performed really, really well. Uh, which, and I don't mean this in any any insulting way at all. But I was shocked at I've I've been shocked at how well it's performed because it's it's in it's within like the top two or three nerdiest podcasts that we've ever done. Uh, I, I think it's probably. It's certainly the podcast. It's the only podcast where I, for a protracted period of time, forgot the camera was there. You know, I just was nerding out with you. Uh, and they say not to let that happen, but it was a ton of fun. And I really appreciate it. So, no, I, I think the, our viewers are thrilled that you're joining us again. Yeah, so am I. So I'm, I'm so glad to to hear about that. And I'm so glad to be here again. For sure. For sure. So um, at the end of every podcast, we always ask, how can we be praying for you shared that you're going and you were getting a new job uh, in this mm -hmm. place? It's a cool place. It's fun to say Wagga Wagga. Am I saying it right? That's right. Awesome. That's right. So update, update us just for a minute and let us know what your life is looking like and how you're doing. Yeah, sure. I mean, since the last episode, um, I've been in um, Wagga Wagga for about uh eight weeks now. Um, and I'm slowly settling into the rhythm of teaching, um, starting to do some of the, um, the admin that is associated with becoming a dean of a seminary, yeah. getting to know the seminarians, getting to know the, 
uh, lecturers, mm. and also getting to know the the church scene in the diocese of Wagga Wagga. This is my first um, the first country diocese that I've actually had a deep immersion in. Mm. Um, so it's been it's been good trying to get to know um, everyone in the church here as well mm. Mm. and that, beyond. Obviously. For sure, for mm-hmm. sure. Now that's beautiful, dude. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. So I, I want to take a minute and just just spend the the beginning giving a little bit of a recap for those who haven't viewed the last episode, because this isn't necessarily a part two. Um, but I, I think there is a little bit of context that would be helpful. Um, so maybe sure. just starting with uh, just a basic and we can go through this together, but it may be starting with what was the thesis for the article that you wrote? Uh, it's more of an essay on uh, mm. pornography and Christology. Mm. Yeah. The, um, uh, the, the basic thesis, if I had to reduce it to a one-liner, mm. um, was that porn was not about sex. I think that was something mm. that we covered in our previous episode. Yeah. Um, and I also went on to say in that article that not only is porn not about sex, porn is actually about salvation. Mm. And we consume porn not simply because, as we were saying in the previous episode, not simply because we um, desire to satisfy our sexual appetites, Mm. um, but also because of the fact that we are seeking some kind of redemption of a moment Mm. that we want to get out of. Mm. Um, And I I basically laid out uh, a metaphysical argument, which then led to a theological argument. Mm. um, And uh, and that essentially sums up what um, pornography and Christology was about. And ending the the article, I contrasted um, the you know the the sort of messianism or the salvation that is promised by pornography mm-hmm. with the Christology and the redemption that is promised by Jesus Christ, and contrasted the two. Can you talk to us for a minute about? Um... And that's helpful. And that's really important to be saved from the moment. I, I've noticed that um, since that since that episode, obviously, it, it was turning in my head and and realizing that, um, well, just for context, audience, we use this uh, phrase called m- metaphysics. Um, and we were talking about how in the last episode, the metaphysics is the kind of the, the final answer to your final why. If you ask why, why, why uh, enough times, you'll get to a person metaphysics. It's really kind of a general truth or the absolute truth uh, about the universe or about reality or whatever it might be. And and just just to bring this down to earth a little bit more, uh, every kid is a metaphysicist in a sense, because children are always asking why, and they ask why ad nauseum. Uh, and they're really just trying to establish what is reality and what's going on, trying to figure out the big stories of life and what things are made of. Um, so that's metaphysics. Uh, we all do it all the time. Uh, just because it's a it's a big word doesn't mean it, it's not something we all partake. It isn't something we all partake in. So Matthew, when it comes to the metaphysics there, because you were uh, mm-hmm. giving us an orientation of of actuality to possibility and possibility mm-hmm. to actuality can you flesh that out some because uh, i think that'll probably be important moving forward yeah sure thing i'm uh the simple version would be that um in the prior to um uh, the arrival of modernity there was a uh, an idea that actual things always uh, were more important than possible things. What Mm. is always is um, uh, far more important, far more potent than what actually might be. Um, But as we enter into the modern age, and by modern age, I'm talking here about the late 1200s, you get a reversal of this priority mm. so much so that we we now like as our default think that what might be becomes far more important than what actually is mm. um, so we can look at what actually uh, you know what actually is in front mm. of us and actually say well yes and and actually say um, this could be something more mm. um, and that becomes the our kind of like our default setting right mm. we, we look at the world as what it might be 
as opposed to um, what it actually is, mm. thinking that what might be might be better than what it, what it actually is. Mm. Um, and, yeah. And just to, to clarify, um, as the wheels have been turning for me, it seems like this is the meta, the metaphysic of, of uh, consumerism. Absolutely. Okay. Right? You have an ad coming up before you and says, think of what your life might be mm. if only you mm. had this product. That's really good. Yeah, mm. I've I've noticed that, and I mentioned this in the last episode. I noticed even having Amazon, the app on my phone, mm -hmm. um, I think of something I can go and I can buy it. And I find that when I had the app on my phone, I was buying so many more things, not because mm -hmm. I needed them, but because I could. Right. I was that's being right. sold possibility. And so I mm -hmm. was I was that's what I was purchasing all the time. And that is mm -hmm. the case with pornography, because um, we had referenced even a uh, that that porn convention in Vegas uh, mm -hmm. and how prostitutes are half a block away. But it's being sold. The porn convention is being sold out because people aren't there for sex. They're there for porn. Right. Like porn mm. doesn't just doesn't just satisfy the libido it actually replaces the libido and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's the possibility and the variety and the novelty that people get mm -hmm. addicted to is that is that fair that's right that's right and and so what the uh, business model of pornography is is not so much the selling of sex which is why i said that porn is not about sex mm. porn is actually about the types of sex or the variety of sex that you could possibly engage in mm. um and, and so much so that the satisfaction, and this is not something that I mentioned in the article, but um, I mentioned it in another context, that the satisfaction of sexual desire is actually not what the porn industry is about. Mm. Uh, in fact, the satisfaction of sexual desire uh, ruins the business model yes. um, of pornography. Yes. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that with uh, tube sites. Um, tube sites are basically the hosting sites for pornography, and they intentionally make the videos like, three, four, five minutes, basically just short enough that you can't actually get off to them because they don't mm -hmm. want you to. They want you to continue to live on that cliffhanger for each and every single episode. So like a lot of, I, I, I didn't know this until recently, but um, a large, large statistic of porn viewers will have multiple videos going at once trying to create this kind of collage of, of identity or something, collage of pleasure really, mm -hmm. so that they can eventually uh, get off to it. Well, that's right. That's right. Actually, that's, that's kind of fascinating because that is something that, um, it kind of, um, ties together the idea of possibility, the, the chasing of possibility mm. and the splitting of our personality. Mm. Um, oh. one of the, you know, the ancient father's origin said that, um, where there is sin, there is multiplicity. Mm. Um, and one of the, um, hmm. I, I, this is something that I haven't yet fully fleshed out, but there is something, uh, I think there is something to the argument that the chasing of sin or the, the, sorry, the, the, the living out of the life of sin hmm. is actually the living out of uh, a, a life where one is constantly chasing um, possibility over what is actual hmm. Um, hmm. to the point where if you chase multiple possibilities and there can be multiple possibilities, if there is no actuality, hmm. Mm. then it, one shouldn't be all that surprised uh, when you have a, a situation like what you just described, mm. where you have a single person um, chasing over multiple pos possibilities at the same time mm. and making that and the, you know supposedly the experience of a single person, you know, mm. trying to make it as if it was a, the experience of a single person. Mm. So I, it, it, that's just a fascinating, um, a fascinating little, you know, uh, vignette. It is, yeah. Uh, that kind of demonstrates, um, you know, demonstrates not just why um, uh, the pursuing of pornography is, you know, is a sin because it leads to sexual immorality, mm -hmm. but because it actually splits our personality. And yeah, I, I, even as you say it, it's striking to me, uh, the garden with the trees, because there are... Mm -hmm. A thousand yeses and one no, but it's the one no yep. that we really get fixated on because mm -hmm. that's the option. It's the option that we're not allowed to have. And it's like, I, I want that option. And so it's like, mm. it's, it's because it, there is an element to sin and I don't know how, how, how big necessarily this element mm -hmm. is when it comes to sin, but uh, sin, uh, being self-sovereignty, the ability yep. for me to choose for myself what I want, mm -hmm. you know, and to create my own future, to create my own world. And that really is the, uh, 
I mean, that's, I mean, that's the devil in pornography. Mm. Uh, it creates a different world for me to live inside of, and I want that's to go right. and I want to live in that world. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, the uh, what what's fascinating about now that you raise the the Genesis account mm. was that when. Um, uh, you know, in, in the events leading up to the fall, uh, the book of Genesis basically said that Eve was, you know, um, uh, you know, was, uh, what's the word? Um, it fell into the allure of of looking at the fruit and um, talking right. about the knowledge, thinking of the knowledge that it might bring. Yes. It's the possibility of yeah. knowledge, yeah. Uh, you know, that became the source of the allure mm. of, um, mm. you know, of the, the fruit temptation. Of the that's right. So, um, so I think there is something to be said about um, the idea of this possibilism, which is mm. something that uh, mm. philo uh, the philosopher John Milbank um, described it as, mm. um, and the pursuit of the life of sin. Mm. Yeah, I've noticed that. I, uh, I on my phone, I've been using just grayscale, uh, which is just basically just black and white, um, mm -hmm. and so no color. And it was interesting to see uh, my brain react. Like uh, there was probably a week of some kind of psychological withdrawal because mm -hmm. I, I can hit the the home button three times and color will come back on. And all of a sudden yep. I'm I'm put off by how vivid and sharp that color yeah. is now when I go back to it. Uh, it's mm -hmm. so artificially constructed, but it's it's so vivid. You'd be hard pressed to find that kind of uh, vivid reflection in actual creation. And mm. so it pulls mm. me into this world that's on my phone. And even the yeah. colors are more tantalizing than anything I would find in cr the creation around me. And so mm -hmm. I want to live in this digital virtual world of possibilities mm -hmm. more when I more than I want to inhabit the world around me. And so I was just yeah. I was struck even by that, by that reality, this thing that they've created for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the well, oh, well, Sorry, my 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 ultra nerdy brain is starting to get into a, a whole new um, <laughs> topic area uh, around this idea of hyper reality, hmm. um, where uh, basically it's where uh, virtual reality becomes more real than reality itself. Yeah, um, there is a link between you know the the, the chasing of possibilism uh, of possibility and hyper reality hmm. that is there. Hmm. Um, but um, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably hold back from cool. from you know exploring that uh, that little you know that little yes um, tangent uh, that maybe thing. yeah so it's, it's only the, but it is it is fascinating because it, in a way that it does follow from the um, you know from our discussion on pornography yeah um, because you know the the idea is that um, pornography works on on this sort of I don't know this sort of um, this uh, conceit. Mm -hmm. that the virtual world can actually be far more real than reality itself. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and because of that, we, const we constantly um, pursue that, right? Because mm -hmm. we actually are hardwired, uh, philosophically speaking, we actually are hardwired to, um, you know, to go after what is, what is good and not just, not just what is good, but what is, um, the most perfect good, mm. right? This is what Aristotle says. Mm. Um, and reality is a good for us to pursue. Yeah. Right? yeah. And if, yeah. if we are led to believe that virtual reality is far more real than actual reality, mm. then it is no wonder that we'll become addicted mm. to um, virtual reality and the virtual world presented by uh, you know, presented by all sorts of other, you know, platforms, not just the pornographic ones. Mm. Yeah, no, mm. I, I think that's a, a big deal. I, I mean, I, I recall even this, this video of a guy having sex with a woman, but he had a VR set over his eyes. So mm -hmm. he's, he's changing like the women he's sleeping with on this thing while that's he's right. having sex with an actual woman. And it's just a, right. a grisly representation of, mm. of dehumanization. And it's a grisly representation that has become sanitized by um, this label that we now use called augmented reality. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that sound um, so fancy? In, yeah. It's a, you know, it, what it is, is actual, is an actual distortion of reality, mm. but it's being presented as a more real version of reality. Yeah. You know, it's augmented. Yeah. Um, or just as supplementary, you know, as though, yeah. as though they complement one another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I like all of that.
Hello, Shane here. I wanted to take a moment and let you guys know about a new resource that we created for you. It's a kind of a sexual integrity assessment and I really have found great benefit from it. I, I very much dislike the kinds of assessments that make you uh, ask and answer 200 questions. It makes me doubt myself and I get all sorts of confused. And this assessment only has something like 20 questions versus the 200. Uh, it's entirely confidential and the benefit to an assessment like this is that we can't fight a nameless, formless ghost. Uh, and it gives name and form to the unwanted sexual behavior in our life so that we can start to know healing and start to know real redemption in our lives. And of course, uh, it doesn't just leave you there, it creates a, a load of options afterwards uh, for you to move forward, to know how to continue on your path of healing. So I recommend it for those reasons. And of course, options are given afterwards for what it looks like to move forward and to continue to find healing. Uh, and to know wholeness. Um, so look for those. It's a huge resource, huge benefit. And the resource is two-pronged. If you're struggling, then this resource exists for you. And for those who have already gotten some ways down on the journey of healing, uh, there's a way to actually give back and to be present to those who are struggling, to take the gift of redemption in your own life and start to give it to other people. The link will be down below. It will be right under the description. I'll make it the first link in the show notes. So do check that out and let's go ahead and get back to the interview. My mind, I probably like yours, is splintering all over the place. And it is important yeah. to note that we, even as we use the phrase pornography, we are uh, probably referring it to more as a kind of porn culture and porn mm -hmm. is um, uh, paradigmatic in these conversations of consumerism as a whole. Hence the, the, the Amazon, even, you know, Amazon being using this kind of metaphysic of selling us possibility and variety. Um, mm -hmm. So just for that's shorthand for a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I do, I want to, I want to imagine with you, Matthew, um, like we, we can all, I mean, we don't have to exercise any imagination to know what it looks like to live from possibility to actual. I am, I am, I'm engaged and, and it's been interesting to see, uh, see one of the ways that I've needed to die to self, um, has been dying to possibility. Right. And that's been a, a, a conversation with Kaylee. Uh, and it's not something I expected, you know, that that I didn't know that I had fostered or been indoctrinated with possibility that, you know, anytime I would see a pretty woman or somebody at the gym, all of a sudden these possibilities would go off in my head. And in a split second, you can create this entire narrative, you know, this entire narrative of possibility. And and to say, like, no, like Kaylee, like it's just you. Like there is no, there's no, like there's no possibilities beyond you and me and you are going to build a, a lifetime of, of actuals together. Um, and that's a yeah. beautiful thing. And to kill those possibilities. And I hadn't realized that was something my heart was really seeded with uh, in big ways. And so it doesn't take us a lot of imagine. It doesn't require a lot of imagination to imagine uh, post living in possibility, but it does, it does require a lot of imagination to know what it means to live in the actual and to foster being present mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. reality. And so that's, uh, I mean, before I ask any questions, you're welcome to, to throw any thoughts into that, but I would like to ask yeah, questions yeah. along that thread. Well, I mean, you've articulated really well, just how ironic it is, right? Mm -hmm. That it requires imagination to live mm -hmm. yeah. in, in actuality. Um, and again, it just shows how, um, it's not so much how hardwired we are, but certainly how conditioned we have become um, to oh, favor see. the possible over the actual. Yeah. Um, and you know the 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 most you know common way that kind of happens is when um, men relate to women, and the first thing they think of is, ah, is this person, um, you know, is this person a possible a possible you know girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, and you, you kind of like project, you know, project ahead um, to the, uh, uh, from the actual encounter and kind of superimpose that projection onto the person. Hmm. Um, so much so that it kind of skews the actual um, interactions with, uh, you know, with that person. Hmm. And somehow to, 
kind of not let the not let the projection kind of get a, get a, uh, get away from you, mm. right? Yeah. And and try to interact with that person as he or she is. Yeah, requires a heck of a lot of training mm. um, that for many many years we have not been given. Yeah. 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 So I, I think I, it was really good that you that you mentioned that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Even the the recent conversation with Hope Johnson. Um, That's right. Was I was really, just thinking of that episode. Yeah. When you were, when you were talking about that. Very helpful because there are a lot of contribute contributing mm-hmm. factors to this, and and the one that Hope and I picked up on was was that a full human being is somebody who's in a relationship, you know, somebody who has a spouse or a counterpart. Uh, But then it like leaves a lot of questions about, you know, Jesus and his singleness or Paul and his singleness and what it looks like to be a fully formed human being and to Mm -hmm. partner with God so that Christ can be fully formed inside of you. And you're just a single, Mm. single individual and what that looks like. Of course, it's all always Mm. done in, in the communion of, of community. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, like you don't have to, I don't, I just, I'm, I'm very hesitant to say like, you need to be married. And I think that's been the, the narrative that a lot of us have gotten. Like you're not like, where's your other half. Right. And that's language mm-hmm. that we use. Like you're not a fully formed human being until you're married. So yes. I think that's another contributor. Anyways, um, it's always very, very easy to digress with you. Um, which is a, com- oh, a compliment. If, if, if I may make a small digression. Sure. Sure. Listeners. Who listen to that episode with Hope Johnson? Mm. Hope is great, mm. and that episode was great. Mm. Do listen to it. Here, here. Now back to our show. <laughs> Thank you for that commercial break, Matthew. <laughs> um, okay, so do you even have any cursory thoughts about um, living from actual to possible? No, I do actually, um, and this this kind of came up in the context of another conversation I had. So I had, uh, by way of context, I had another. Um, conversation with um, uh, with a friend of mine, Justine Toe, yeah. who um, does some podcasting for the Center for Public Christianity over yeah. here in Australia. Yeah. So, um, cool. in that in that conversation, I made the point that one of the um, you know the challenges um, that that we face in a culture that has been dominated by pornography is not only the fact that we now have to, you know, uh, how should we say, invest ourselves in human relations that are bounded by, bounded by bodies, mm. right? That's the first thing, the first yeah. step of the thing. That, okay. that um, you know, kind of part of the, part of the, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find the words to, to you know, to, mm. to put it. Part of the combating, let's just say, right? Part of the combating of the dominance of the logic of pornography mm. um, uh, is, is anchored in, and that word anchored, I think is a really important one, mm. um, is anchored in a, a, a mode of relating to human persons that are embodied, that are yeah. bounded by bodies. Because yeah. pornography um, is you know far from being a an embodied pursuit is a disembodied pursuit. Yeah, um, you are you know um, kind of investing your body to the chasing of a virtual body. Yeah, um, and when you become when that becomes your default setting, mm. um, it becomes really hard to actually relate to another person um, mm. that is bounded in time and space. Mm. And actually has a body that does not, um, you know, meet with the kinds of projections that one has in virtual reality. Mm. That's the first thing. That's good. Um, and the second uh, aspect of uh, the combating of the the logic of pornography, mm. um, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to um, relationships that lead towards marriage. Is the fact that you're not just investing in um, in human bodies, but that you're investing in one body, mm. yeah, right? So that you so that you and your spouse form one flesh, one single body, mm. and that too, um, and, and I think that kind of ties in with um, that my earlier point about multiplicity, right? You're, is you're you're not simply chasing virtual bodies but you're chasing many virtual bodies yeah and in marriage you're not, you're being conditioned now to, or training yourself to 
um, learn to invest yourself in one single body. Yeah. Um, that, you know, is, is, it's a hard task. It's a hard ask. Yes. Um, when you, uh, you know, when you're living in a culture that is saturated by um, pornography as the chasing of possibility. Yeah, there was a, there was a trigger for me. And unfortunately, it, it only went off maybe three years ago where I started to really be influenced by uh, the reality that our bodies are temples uh, mm-hmm. and that are part of our priesthood. Uh, it's like, I mean, Protestants were saying that all the time, priesthood of all believers, you know, and, and, and yet I'd never been taught that, um, that body care is temple care, that it's, that it's a part of our priesthood is temple care. It's, it's tending to our bodies well. Um, and, mm. and there is, I mean, it's especially in Colossians three, uh, let, let the spirit of God, let the spirit of Christ dwell amongst you richly dwell within you richly. Um, mm-hmm. There's, there's, a, let the peace of Christ dwell within you. This is really, really rich language, especially there in Colossians three, of mm. uh, of being intentional about how we're hosting Christ, right, within yes. our frames, within our bodies, and uh, and then realizing since then that that when I am living, when I'm living misembodied, I feel disembodied. That when mm-hmm. I I'm, when I'm not actively using my body in intentional ways, I feel estranged in my body when I'm not exercising Mm. or going for walks or just connecting tactilely with leaves or grass or sand or whatever it might be. But there's moments when I am interacting with the world around me and using my body to do that. uh, I feel more human. Mm. Mm. No, that's right. And um, um, I think that that idea of uh, dwelling in you richly, um, is something that I can possibly jump off. Hmm. Uh, and that is, you know, and this goes back to our earlier conversation about possibility and actuality, hmm. right? Um, uh, part of the reason why, um, you know, why the, the, the medievals favored um, actuality over possibility hmm. was that actuality it was the the actual jump off point from which reality could be more richly engaged. Yes. The the idea of possibilism mm. is you know works off the idea that I can only live my life more richly or I can only engage reality more richly if I leave reality. Mm. Um, when in actual fact, and it you know to us it sounds you know I mean um, uh, you know part of my Australianisms, but it sounds bloody obvious. Mm. Um, when um, you you say that the only way to engage reality more richly is to engage it as it is hmm. actual and uh, as it is in actuality, yeah. Um, um, but that was the metaphysical commitment hmm. uh, of the you know of mo- most people or the default setting of most people prior to the onset uh, of the uh, of modernity in the late twelve hundreds, hmm. um, and and you know that. That is another challenge, right? It's another dimension of our challenge. It's not simply to invest in the one body as if what we are doing is cutting off a, a, a richer living of life, mm. but to actually retrain ourselves to actually say, no, in my investment in this one body of my spouse or this actual mm. body of my of my friends, mm. um, you know, in the embodied existence of my friends, mm. um, there therein lies the um, the the fullness of reality, mm. the richness of reality, which far exceeds any possibility that I might imagine. Mm. Um, and in fact, in fact, um, this is again uh, another one of these medieval investments mm. that the richness of the in, of the possibilities that you imagine, right, become far more fertile mm. if you actually um, invest yourself with mm. what is actually in front of you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you know, yeah, it's that commitment that in that one, in, a, in that, um, uh, you know, that seemingly limited um, reality of an embodied person in front of you mm. lies a whole universe of possibility. Yeah. Um, and you can only experience that in the actuality of that embodied person. Mm. Um, therein lies the challenge mm. of, um, you know, combating the logic of pornography. Now, 
the the Catholic theologian in me, um, you know, uh, thinks that what, when I think of, of things like that, I think of the sacraments, yeah. right? When I think of, um, for instance, when Catholics celebrate the Eucharist, for instance, mm. they don't just um, you know don't, they don't just have this commitment that says, um, you know, that the Eucharistic elements um, contain the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But it is, you know, it is the, the the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word through whom everything was made, mm. right? The entire, you know, as, as as we say in the prologue of the the prologue of the Gospel of John, right? It is through the inc- the divine Word that everything came into being. Amen. In other words, the whole universe is bound up in the in the in the Word, which then becomes flesh for us. Amen. And then becomes present, and this is the Catholic in me talking, right? It becomes present for us in the Eucharistic elements, mm. and so we are always presented with a challenge every time we we uh, go into the Eucharist, right? Mm. We are presented with this idea that says, "Herein lies the universe. Mm. Herein lies um, the possibilities that you have been chasing." Mm. Um, yes, yeah, it's it's. Uh... It's beautiful because the the I have this I have friend, um, Whaler, and he he use he's got a, a phrase of, of sacred and silly, um, mm-hmm. and it's it's going to be true uh, in this context of the sacred and the mundane, and oftentimes yeah. the sacred is known in the mundane. Usually, it's mm. I mean it's 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 habit and discipline that ends up mm-hmm. reshaping virtue inside of us. Just like mm-hmm. these very mundane things that create very extraordinary results, you know, because even as you're yeah. talking, I'm thinking of Kaylee and I are remodeling this house because it's the house we're going to be moving into. And the kitchen in particular has been very difficult. Um, and there are plenty of times where I want to, to do other things in digital realities, even like quote unquote good things, maybe respond to mm-hmm. emails or do work or whatever it might be. Um, but there really wouldn't be much fruit from them other than distracting me from the work that I have, Mm -hmm. namely working on this kitchen. And if we actually work on this kitchen and get it done, then there Mm -hmm. will be over its lifetime, hundreds of people that will host, like it'll see hundreds of people and thousands of meals. And, and I mean, how do you even start to measure the laughter and the tears and the conversations that'll be had within this Mm -hmm. one room. And so just engaging this actual thing has this, this host of possibility and this rich variety and multiplicity of realities um, Mm -hmm. that will ensue from it. Uh, But the, the foil for it is me wanting to spend time reading whatever the heck on my computer or just hiding away because I'm planning for a wedding and I'm trying to remodel a house and I'm trying to get to know this woman and I have work, mm-hmm. you know, like all sorts of things. So I, I mm-hmm. like everything you're saying because it has immediate application to how we exist and how we have life. Yeah, yeah. And um, you you made a very important reference to the word habit there. Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, you know, the it will require training it's, mm. uh, to to learn to say to recognize um, uh, the full or a rich um, uh, unfolding of poss- possibility yeah. in whatever is actual and whatever is in front of you. Mm. Um, I, I just pulled up uh, a, a quote from uh, the poet William Butler Yeats mm. um, that says, "The world is full of magic things." patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Mm. Amen. Um, and that's what habits do, right? Mm. Habits are the constant investment in what is in front of us mm. so that our senses may grow sharper. And mm. therein lies the, um, in a way, therein lies the, um, the irony of uh, a culture that is, you know, saturated with the chasing of the possible in that the possible we, we tend to think that the possible is a far richer existence than what is in what is actually in front of us right but in actual fact what is happening in the process of chasing that possibility is that our senses grow duller hmm. right so hmm. that whatever possibilities we face then become repetitions of the possibilities that we were chasing before hmm. Mm. Um, you know, so much so that when you, mm. where we, ch- we, we, let's say in a consumer culture, right, mm. where we, we chase the next new big thing, yeah. we find out that the next new big thing was kind of like just a variation of the, what came before. Yeah. 
um, you know, in a different packaging. Yeah. Right? This applies to consumerism. It can apply to, um, it can apply to, to pornography as well. Mm. Um, it can even apply to uh, the way we, we look at human relationships when we start, you know, with, with our dulled senses, dulled by the constant chasing of possibility, we then start to treat actual persons um, kind of like how we treat consumer products, mm. uh, where we treat them as kind of like people that fit into types, mm. for instance. We catalog people, mm. right? That's people who fit into types and basically say, oh, um, you're just a variation of, of this type that came before. Mm. Um, whereas... Um, learning to relate to actual persons, actual embodied persons, mm. um, you know, requires, as you know, requires, as you say, like discipline, it requires certain habits of relating, mm. but in the process of developing those habits, right. The, um, uh, a w another word to use these, to talk about these habits mm. is virtue, right. Mm. Which are habits of desire and habits of love. Mm. As we learn to develop these habits of love, our senses develop our capacity to actually recognize what is in this actuality, what might unfold from, unfold from this um, actuality mm. um, uh, deepens and grows richer. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've heard, I've heard parents talk about that, um, mm -hmm. about being able to see their hearts uh, kind of the, the, like a diamond turning and all of a sudden seeing new facets, they're able to see their yeah. heart grow bigger in real time when they have kids. It's like, it's like, mm -hmm. like they love their, this one kid with all their heart, you know? And it's like, how can we love more? And then all of a sudden they have another kid and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they, they all of a sudden just see their heart expand. Right. And mm -hmm. so they are creating something, actually creating something. Uh, mm -hmm. and of course a world of, a world of possibility, a world of lifetime, uh, is enveloped mm -hmm. in that little, that little, you know, that little bundle. Um, uh, but nonetheless, yep. it, it, they, they see their senses, uh, keenly transformed as you say um and those those very is, well it is it's a, it's a simple action you know a really beautiful mm. action but simple nonetheless That's so right. I, I like that I, I i do i i'm having a hard time i think in my head um establishing a kind of baseline about what is what does it mean to be human you know in a mm. sense it's like okay like uh, is is being present the goal is is uh, the list of you know virtues as maybe like Galatians are to these are the fruits of the spirit you know like what mm. what is the goal because <clears throat> right now we're we're talking about what learning to be embodied will give you um, yeah. uh, to, uh, basically to what end you know and mm. and it's it's a it's both kind of almost causal and teleological it's 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 yes. it's before as a motivator and a hope you know so like what what yeah. Are you, yeah. are you able to, is that, is that making sense? Yeah, it is making sense. I, um, uh, I guess they're, they're kind of like two one liners that, mm. um, I think I, I presented to you prior, uh, in our discussion prior to mm. the podcast. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there's this one, uh, one liner by Simone Weil, the, mm. the French philosopher, 20th century French philosopher who, who once said that attention is the greatest form of mm. charity. Yeah. Um, you know, we are, Made in the image of God, we are hardwired um, towards um, towards love and towards charity. Mm. Um, and if Simone Weil is right, then what becomes the fullest manifestation of that charity mm. is uh, a, an investment that comes, or an, you know, emotional and intellectual investment that comes with um, comes with attention. Mm. Um, the you know, the logic of pornography is, um, you know, is one whereby one's attention um, is never is never resting on anything at any one time, uh, you know, at any moment for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. For any substantial amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas right. attention does require um, that, you know, that constant investment. Yeah. And you can't have that constant investment until you have developed the habits or the virtues to give you that investment because it's a giving of yourself, mm. right? The attention is a form of charity because it requires for you to give of yourself, give of your time, give of your energies, uh, give of your mind um, to, yeah. to any one particular thing. And you can't, yeah. you, can't act, um, you can't give of yourself to a possibility. Mm. 
I mean, people do. It's not to say that people don't do it. They do do it. Mm. But when they do do it, they don't actually um, grow in charity. Mm. Right? And in fact, they are, you know, their hearts, instead of, um, instead of growing as a result of that investment, that investment in possibility actually causes the heart to shrivel. Mm. Right? Which is kind of, mm. in a way, it's not surprising right? that, um, you know, that the, uh, the consumption of pornography is also sometimes synonymous with the development of incredibly selfish mm. slash um, misogynistic mm. slash misanthropic um, attitudes, mm. Mm. right? Because we have um, allowed our hearts to kind of like shrivel in the process of chasing after these possibilities. Mm. Now, it's not just in pornography, it happens in, in, in other things as well, of course. right? You know, in our culture where possibility is the default setting. Yeah. Um, so that was that that was one. I hope that makes sense. But that was one idea that uh, that came into my head. What you know? What does it mean to be human? To be human is to um, you know is to grow in charity. Yes. If we are made in the image of God, and to grow in charity requires attention. Yes. Yes. Um, and so then, and that, what is yeah? And so then, pursuing mm-hmm. things that foster attention giving abilities. Um, mm. That's that's significant, and because I mean, pornography fra- it literally fragments your brain. It, it jacks up neural mm-hmm. networks. It subverts your prefrontal cortex, which then causes it to like atrophy. It's like shrivels up. It's it's our decision. It's like which is literally your decision making mm. hardware, you know? Right. right. Um, and of course, right. So, so there's a physiological kind of correlation. Yeah. Uh, with what is what is essentially a, a philosophical or a metaphysical proposition. Yeah, yeah, which um, which shows um, its validity that it's not it's not just a thought, you know, like it's not just a, a belief system. It's an actuality yeah. in that sense, right? It's it's uh, right. it's it really is what it means to be human because it has repercussions mm. against upon the temple upon again going back to being embodied properly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And. Um, and again, the, the, the question of attention, um, uh, sorry, the growing in attention and growing in charity um, also brings in, at least in, in terms of our own experience, it also might bring in something that many of us will, will find um, galling, right? Which is uh, repetition. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. You, know, the, you, you only can grow, uh, you know, grow yeah. in your dexterity in relation to something if you experience it over and over again. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. so repetition becomes uh, a very important, um, a important you know way of learning to be able to develop these um, these capacities. Yeah. Right. So, and and this repetition you will find in um, in all sorts of all sorts of things in all sorts of human relationships. Mm. You will find yourself, especially if you um, you know if you were to um, uh, you know get married. Right, you may have to end up developing rituals where you kind of go through the same experience over and over again. Whether it is something like, you know, what you say and what you do with each other as you, uh, you know, as you leave the house, re-enter the house, wash mm. the dishes, mm. going to bed, those kinds of things. Mm. Um, these are like real mundane things that you learn over and over again. But what you are learning is actually the growth in charity, mm. Mm. right? Um, the, the the growth of the heart. Mm. Matthew, what what does it look like to uh, intentionally live within our bodies and to foster mm. attention? I, um, I, I maybe a, an example of what I mean is I, I know that um, I know that like the we all know this that the screens that we're all interacting through like it it creates different kinds of knots in our prefrontal cortex. Um, and they're not hard to get rid of, you know, like it's just like a little bit of distance from screen time, having a grayscale on your phone, different things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Leaving, I, I try and leave my computer at work and I don't have a TV at home. So that means yeah. I have to come up with creative things to do. And there yeah. have been times when I've been so bored at home that I've left home, come to work, grab my computer, gone back home so I could watch something like just mm-hmm. YouTube, something stupid, so dumb, mm-hmm. you know, but if I don't bring it, then it means that I actually have to, if I want to watch something, I actually have to watch it with my housemates, you know, like mm-hmm. I have to actually do it in community. 
or I have to read or I have to do different. I, now I like I order different puzzles and things like that that I can do. And mm. it's fun to do. It cultivates me, but it's also mindless activity. Um, mm. And even then, like that's just me like trying to figure out how to live without screens always in front of me because I've I've read enough times that they impact my ability to be present. What are what are other ways that people can actively foster and develop and steward their ability to be charitable and their focus and just because when you're giving somebody mm. your attention you're saying your voice and your thoughts and your personhood is worth me listening to it's dignifying them yeah. right it's a beautiful mm. gift it is charity it's love true and true like through and through and and so what what do you what do you yeah what do you recommend and and how do you i don't even know if it's something you prescribe but at the very least something that you put forward for consideration Oh yeah, uh, I don't think I should be the person to go to to, to, pre to prescribe anything. Um, uh, you know, the, the 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 question of attention really is um, something that I have been, you know, I have been um, thinking about precisely mm. because I, you know, I am working in such a mm. in, in a digital, you know, digitized environment that distracts yeah. me, and yeah. I'm really finding that paying attention to any one particular thing is actually hard now. Mm. Um, so learning to develop those, um, you know, rituals that garner attention mm. um, uh, is something that I'm, you know, sort of like looking into. That's probably cool. another thing um, that I'm, that I'm uh, looking into is the integration of um, the integration of patterns, you know, patterns of, of prayer mm. uh, into my otherwise digitized, uh, highly digitized existence. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways that I that I do it is, um, you know, is that I have um, what you know what in the Catholic Church we call the liturgy of the hours mm. um, uh, on my phone, right? That's so cool. that at regular periods of the day, um, I am you know sort of investing myself in prayer, whether at in the morning, in the afternoon, mm. um, in the evening. Mm. Um, and because what that does is that in a way it kind of forces me to stop mm. what I'm doing. Mm. Um, you know, it, you know, in the process of in my, in my day, when I'm becoming like pulled in many different directions, mm. at regular intervals, I am called to stop, just stop so that you can, um, uh, you know, it, through the liturgy of the hours, at least immerse yourself in the Psalms, in some of the prophetic readings, um, and also, you know, engage in this, um, you know, in this regimen of repetition. Yeah. Um, that bit by bit helps me grow in that charity that I, you know, that I said comes with attention. Yeah. Um, what else is another thing? No, um, the other thing is learning to sleep. Hmm. Um you know, I mean, um, one of the one of the offshoots of of living in the culture that we live in that is so highly, um, you know, digitized is that we are struggling to sleep, mm. Um, mm. and that is also something that, um, you know, something that I think helps us garner attention, right? P partly because what sleep does, uh, and a, and a priest friend of mine told me this that apparently what what sleep does is that your your brain kind of gets cleansed it, you know it gets washed off mm. of uh, various types of toxins um and and physiologically speaking that what that does um is help help the brain at least at a physiological level helps you at a physiological level um invest more in what it is that you are actually doing mm. um because if you don't if you don't sleep you're mm. kind of still living through one day carrying over the leftover bits from another day. Hmm. Right. Um, and again, being able to sleep requires ritual. And I think if I had to boil everything down to like one word, it's that word ritual, Yeah. right? Whether it is rituals of prayer, rituals of exercise, rituals of sleep, hmm. um, and even rituals of food. Yeah. Um, you know, as a as a migrant from Singapore, I cannot actually like end a conversation or at least not work food into um, the conversation because mm. food is um, uh, you know and it, a really important thing not just for our bodies but even for our communities as well. Mm. Um, being able to integrate food into um, 
you know, into community building exercises, mm. right? Because that's what food is. Food is actually a means by which you not only nourish your cells, but you nourish your, you don't just nourish your biological body, you're nourishing the social body yeah. um, as well. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that also has a part to play in the integration of our own spiritual life as well. Mm. Um, the, I'm thinking here of um, uh, an Orthodox theologian named Alexander Schmiemann, mm. and he wrote a book called um, "For the Life of the World," mm. looking at the you know looking at the the the, the sacraments of the church. And one mm. of the things that he he said um, was that food has now become the last sacrament, mm. even in a, a seemingly godless culture. Mm. Food is now some is more than just mere materials. It actually is something more than that. And I think, you know, being able to develop patterns around food, um, you know, developing rituals around food mm. um, can also help us grow in that attention, whether mm. it is attention to what we are eating or attention to who we are eating it with. Mm. 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 I love all of that. I, I, I think uh, what's particularly striking about that is some of those some of those practices require us to be present to other people. And some of mm. those practices require us to be present to ourselves, um, yeah. which is something that is worth saying because a big part of mm -hmm. my motivation to seek out stimulation, um, virtual mm -hmm. stimulation, whether it be pornography or YouTube, uh, is self-avoidance. Um, yeah. There, I will avoid, and I don't know what I'm running from most of the time, um, but I'm, for whatever reason, too scared to stop and ask. I'm mm -hmm. too scared to stop and ask myself, hey, like, how are you? Um, did that hurt you? Why are you arguing with that person in your mm. head, you know, and to actually do the work to see whoever I'm arguing with in my head to do the work, to dignify them, give thanksgiving and praise for their life and to let Jesus wash me in, uh, in redemption. You know, I don't mm. want to do that work. And so I run from it and I use yeah. stimulation to run from it. So I, I that's what I like is it's, it's and that, I would encourage anyone listening, uh, praying the hours is awesome. And you can do it with people around you. It's very easy. It's not long. I would highly recommend it. Pray As You Go is an app that allows you to do that. It's it's a, a it's a Catholic app, and I love it. I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you're Protestant or, or Catholic. Um, anyways, I, I, I don't know if I cut you off yeah. there, but I wanted to share that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I um, uh, you saying that, is making me just think of like another another one of these one-liners that I shared with mm. you. Uh, so it's coming from a different angle. Right? Mm. It's um, um, it's it's talking about you know we we talk about self avo uh, self avoidance. Yeah. But one of the other things, uh, uh, one of the other things that we lose sight of in the course of our self avoidance is um, uh, avoiding thinking about what we are becoming in yes. the course of our pursuits of our distractions. That's good. Um, and this this one liner is a, is a much more ancient um, uh, one liner that comes from the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, um, mm. who says that um, we become we become the things that we give our attention to, mm. right? Um, and uh, you know Augustine talks about it in terms of we become uh, we become the objects of our desire and objects of our love. For sure. Whatever we chase, we end up becoming like them. And I think the uh, you know the scriptures also talk about how if we if we worship idols, we end up becoming like our idols. Yes. Um, yes. And, um, you know the and I think that that is actually something to you know something that can actually give us pause. It's not you know so one of the ways that one of the ways that we can kind of like stop and take stock mm. is to actually ask ourselves not just what we are doing. Mm. But realizing that what we are doing makes us become certain people, hmm. right? So we can ask ourselves, "What am I becoming?" That's good. Um, in the course of my, you know, um, chasing distraction after distraction. We didn't mention it this time. We should have in the recap, but we talked at length in the in our other episode about how culture has spiritual formation powers that yes. culture yeah. traffics in images and those images um they calibrate our desires they calibrate our longings uh the things that we thirst for and long for the things that we know we can turn to in pain like pornography these things are calibrating uh 
they're calibrating what we turn to to save us, right? And that was mm. that was that is a part of your your argument in the paper, That's um, right. the significance of culture having spiritual formation power, um, mm -hmm. and not least because we become like the thing we're viewing, pursuing, longing for, whatever it might be. It That's conditions right. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we are chasing after you know after fragments of things or things that are not real. Um, as we do, whether in consumer culture or in pornography, um, we end up becoming fragmented uh, and not real. Yeah. Right? We end up um, we end up mimicking the you know the the, the various virtual yes. realities that we are consuming. Yes. Um, yes. I, that's. I mean, pornography is becoming uh, the number one sex ed. Yeah. Right. Like, like children yeah, are exactly. mimicking those things. Mm -hmm. They're mimicking them on school buses and, and adults are bringing them into their beds because mm. we can't get off without watching porn. But we say that it's, it spruces things up. It spices things up. Yeah. And, you know, well, we have all sorts of justifications for it. And the thing is that it's, uh, and adults are actually bringing, bringing pornography to places other than their beds. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, you know, they're bring, they're taking them to, our fashion houses. They're mm. taking them to our clinics to mm. get you know, where, where we get plastic surgery. They're taking them. Um, they're taking them right. to our tattoo parlors. They're taking them mm. to um, mm. uh, you know our jewelers. Yeah. Our and 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 even our yeah our, and even our you know our toy stores. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the thing is that it's not just it's not just becoming you know something that we do in private. But that's because sex is not something that we do in private anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, in a way, in a way, it is. Well, you know, it, to to not put too fine a point on it, it is a public act. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's, we should not be surprised that it then starts spilling over to places outside of what we might consider public, uh, private. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Um. And there was some there was a point that i was going to make but it has escaped me for now it was so good where to go yeah where was where was it oh i was something it was basically some you know something to the effect that um that the converse is also true and mm. that is that if we you know if we become like the idols we chase mm. we also by you know at least the christian has the hope in actually saying that we have the the chance to um, uh, you know, in the seminary, we talk about we, we talk about conforming, right, or, or configure configuring ours, uh, ourselves to uh, what we should be pursuing, which is Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, you know, we we have the uh, Christians are given well, not just Christians, but everyone is given the chance to configure themselves mm. to um, the person the person of Jesus Christ who. Um, you know, invest him, invested himself mm. in, um, you know, in, in his creatures, not as they could have been, mm. but as they are now, mm. right? And says, I want to give myself to you mm. as you are now. Mm. Um, and, and I think there is actually something, you know, there's something, there's something to that that I think we, we can develop. Mm. Um, I don't have, right now, I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling to actually come up with ways in which we can configure ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ concretely, other than to say that, um, you know, that the, the rituals that we talk about, that we talked about earlier, such as the rituals of prayer, mm -hmm. open us up, give us a forum to, uh, you know, for that configuration to take place. Mm. Um, and I cannot help but work in another Augustine quote um, mm. in one of his homilies. Um, mm. Augustine talks about the, the reception of the Eucharistic elements. Mm. And he uses this line, become what you receive and mm. receive who you are. Mm. Um, and, and in a way, you know, the, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the life, the life of prayer, particularly the life, you know, as a Catholic, I would say that the life of sacramental prayer, mm. sacramental worship um, is giving us a forum uh, to enable to enable us to actually become like what we should be pursuing, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, how you do that, you know, how you do that in 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 real life might have to be the subject of another um, another episode. But I think there is something there that we can develop. Yeah, there's uh, a great neglect 
especially in the Protestant church is the power of aesthetics. Um, mm. And that's exactly what Augustine is utilizing. He's using the, the aesthetic power of the Eucharist to communicate the transformation of it. Um, I, I, I don't, sh I don't know if I've shared this on here or, or, or not, but uh, when I was in counseling years and years ago, um, one of the things that really helped me with, uh, with my desire, my longing, especially when it came around uh, uh, pornography and lust was um, I was seeing a, a therapist who's an Anglican priest and he would have me uh, look at, at the, at the very end of the session, he would have us end with looking at this naked beat up Jesus on a cross, just like this little handheld Jesus on a cross. And uh, he looks awful. <laughs> and and he would sometimes he would start, sometimes I would start, but we would both do it. We'd always do it. You just stare at it for a while. Just stare at it. And eventually you'd say, Jesus, make me the man you died to redeem. Right. And that's mm. how we would close every mm. single counseling session. And we did that for months on end. Right. And but, eventually that engraved itself on my heart. Like it's an experience I'll never be able to get away from. And it's a very touching experience to me. But I think it probably exemplifies exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful line. Make me the man that you died to redeem. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. It does. It sits. It sits strong. Yeah. Um, okay. We, uh, as per usual, we have crushed time, Matthew. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you just for hanging with us, and thank you for exploring. I think this kind of earnest exploration, uh, which is, uh, it feels like a good way to describe what we do. I, I think it's very mm -hmm. profitable and very good. It's a, a way of of thinking and theologizing and feeling in public. And I, I think that's what a lot of millennials, especially just longing for those very real and candid conversations. So thank you for your willingness to have them with us. No, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This has been, this has been wonderful. Yeah. I always, I always like it. Um, let's see. Okay. So, you know, the two questions, one, how can people be tracking with you? Uh, and mm -hmm. then two, um, how can we be praying for you? Sure. Um, the, uh, how how can you track me? You can probably find me best on my blog, which is awkwardasiantheologian.com. You can also find me on Twitter, um, at Asian Theologian. You can also find me on Instagram mm. at Awkward Asian Theologian. Mm. Uh, to go to your second question about uh, what we what you can pray for me for, if I had to. Look, if I had to boil it down to the one thing, it would be that I, uh, you know, and this is me, you know, me preaching to myself, you know, as I was talking to you earlier, mm. probably, you know, for, for me to sort of grow in the awareness of the presence of Christ in my new situation, because mm. here I am in a new town, um, not knowing very many people in a job I'm not familiar with, mm. um, in a setting I am not familiar with. Mm. Um, and, and knowing that in the space, in this kind of like relatively unstable space, mm. that I can learn to recognize the, the stable presence of Jesus Christ in, mm. in what I do in this space. Uh, mm. I think that would be a, a great thing uh, for you to pray for me for. Mm. Amen, dude. Um, uh, a major reason I have these conversations is because I need them. Uh, so yes, we will absolutely be praying with you. It was neat. I, I came across a friend the other day and he was remarking because he had just, he had just finished reading one of your articles on awkward Asian theologian and how there was a proven men group, uh, a sexual integrity group and mm -hmm. somebody in the sexual integrity was, was, was quoting you from an article <laughs> that he had read. And so you're making the rounds, man, and people are really enjoying your work. And oh, that's really so great. I, that's really, really glad. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah, for sure. It was it was neat. It made me it made me happy. I was like, I know that guy. It's my claim to that, fame. I know that guy. Yeah. No, this this makes me happy. Yeah. This makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Matthew. You've been a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. For sure. Oh, everyone, thank you for sticking it out with us. That was uh, I hope it was as fun, much fun for you as it was for me. Uh, thank you for being with us and processing what it looks like just to be present to God, uh, to ourselves and to our neighbors, because that really is what it comes down to. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, strength, soul and mind and to love your neighbors as you love yourself. And there is... 
there's a beautiful kind of trifecta relationship taking place there of learning how to be present to God, present to self so that we can be present to the neighbors that God places around us. Uh, I hope that this helps you in your journey on just learning how to love well uh, and live well. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the Naked Gospel, and we will catch you all next time. Bye.